The American Brain Tumor Association is pleased to welcome you back to our webinar series. My name is Umbreen Mon, Program Manager here at the ABTA. Our webinar topic today is How Metastatic Brain Tumors Affect Your Melanoma Care. Thank you to today's webinar sponsor, GT Medical Technologies, for their support of this program. Today's webinar will provide you with an overview of brain metastases in melanoma, a discussion on treatment options and advancements, and the management of brain metastases, and a peek into the workings of a brain tumor board. Today's webinar is presented in partnership with AIM at Melanoma and Melanoma Research Foundation. We are honored to have two incredible representatives from these organizations with us today to share a few words about the incredible work that they do. Alicia Rowell, Vice President at AIM at Melanoma, and Miriam Kadosh, Director of Education and Patient Engagement at the Melanoma Research Foundation. Thank you both so much for being here today. Alicia, I'll turn it over to you to share a little bit more about AIM at Melanoma. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here and to give you a brief overview of AIM at Melanoma. Uh, we're proud to partner with MRF and ABTA for uh, this webinar. Uh, 20 years ago, a woman named Valerie Gill lost her then 26-year-old daughter to melanoma, and she founded what would become AIM to help other patients and their families not experience what she'd experienced. She found that research had stalled, and collaboration in research was less than robust. She could not find comprehensive information on the internet, and she saw that patient advocacy was lacking. She vowed to solve these issues through AIM. Next slide. Thank you. Please go to our website, the, uh, when you have a minute, of course, the most comprehensive website available for melanoma. There are nearly 2,000 pages of accurate, up-to-date, and patient-centered information. We get over 80,000 unique visitors per month to our website. There are pages on how to tell a mole from a melanoma, how to read and understand your pathology report. There's information on every FDA approved treatment for melanoma and side effect management guides for these treatments. There are printable questions to ask your doctor for every stage of melanoma. We have an ask an expert program. It's a physician assistant in melanoma who's available by email and phone to answer basic questions. We have a peer-to-peer -peer support group, trained peers who are partnered with newly diagnosed people. We host 10 symposiums per year, um, and we have 20 nationwide walks per year. I also want to know that AIM is a leader in melanoma education for healthcare professionals. Um, we have websites for melanoma nurses to help them understand the disease and treatment and patients. And we have resources for all providers who care for patients uh, receiving immunotherapy. Next slide, please. I'm pr proud to tell you for just a moment about our research initiatives. Our Melanoma Tissue Bank Consortium is the only one of its kind in the world. We have two over 210 tissues right now. These are um, fresh frozen primary melanoma tissues and anonymized uh, data to go along with them. Um, we have two Australian sites that will soon join our four US sites. And we hope to open the bank to uh, the world's researchers, um, I, I think by the beginning of next year, uh, enough tissue to go around for researchers to use. Next slide, please. Finally, I want to tell you a bit about our MyPAC group. Um, we fund and partner with um, established melanoma nonprofits across the globe, such as Melanoma Italia in Italy. We translate and acculturate many of the um, website features that I've already told you about so that these uh, advocates um, and their communities can focus on the people with melanoma and they don't need to reinvent the wheel putting together accurate, up-to-date and timely information on melanoma. We translate and acculturate ours for them. Um, this is a, a program that we're really proud of uh, because melanoma is a global disease. Last slide is just a thank you. Uh, please visit AIM at Melanoma. There, you'll find so much there for you, uh, so many resources so much education and um, we, uh, we're proud to be here again. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Alicia. Miriam, I'll turn it over to you to share a little bit more about Melanoma Research Foundation. Good afternoon, everyone. It is so great to be with you all. And I echo Alicia's words that we feel so honored and grateful to both AIM at Melanoma and ABTA for partnering with us. Again, my name is Miriam Kadosh. I am the Director of Patient Engagement and Education at the Melanoma Research Foundation, and I am a licensed clinical social worker. Excited to be here today to tell you a little bit about the MRF and to hear from our fabulous speakers today. The MRF, uh, next slide, please. The MRF's mission is to eradicate melanoma by accelerating medical research while educating to and advocating for the melanoma community. The MRF was founded in 1996, 28 years ago, by a melanoma patient by the name of Diana Ashby. After battling melanoma for three years, Diana founded the MRF to fund research towards effective medical treatments for melanoma. And since then, the MRF has evolved into its current tripartite mission, which is education, advocacy, and research. To date, the MRF has funded over $25 million in research grants, and the research grant program has existed for 26 years, the first grant being awarded in 1998. We, um, we do peer-reviewed review research grants. We have advocate reviewers, so both patients and researchers as reviewers for our, for our peer-reviewed grants. We have scientific initiatives like our Cure Ocular Melanoma Initiative, scientific meetings and workshops, and breakthrough, a breakthrough consortium, which is our um, we also include a, a vision platform, pediatric melanoma initiatives, mucosal melanoma, melanoma brain metastases, like, like today partnering with ABTA and a scientific topic meetings. Um, a little bit about advocacy. We have an annual Hill Day each year that happens in the beginning of May. Um, we have comments to regulatory and legislative policymakers. We advocate on both the state and federal levels. We had advocate mobilization campaigns. We have a global melanoma coalition uh, where we meet and um, issue webinars as well. And then for the education program, we have so many educational materials on our website at melanoma.org under our Education Institute that you can order or download online. And these range uh, many different topics, but some of them are below. We have animated patient videos that you can go on and, and watch videos on specific melanoma topics. We have Ask the Expert webinars once a month patient and caregiver symposia series where we travel all across the country and uh, put on educational programs that meet the patient's needs um, and also support our rare melanoma subtypes like I shared. Next slide. Some resources that we have available, you can find them again on our website, but we have a patient forum, an ask a nurse program where you can ask our melanoma nurse any questions that might be um, coming up for you and we can help get you to the right resource or to the right place. Educational materials, our webinar series, and, and we also uh, have Miles for Melanoma, which is our program that's nationwide. Um, so please find us in your city. We'd love to see you in person. Um, and we also have prevention and awareness campaigns. So this year's hashtag get naked campaign spokesperson is Raheem Mostert of Miami Dolphins running back. He is a melanoma advocate and supporter. And to learn more about this campaign and Raheem, our new spokesperson, um, please visit us online um, where, where we will be discussing all month for May for Melanoma Awareness Month, prevention and awareness of this disease. Um, and you can see on the bottom here, some of our campaigns and offerings to our patient and caregiver community. Next slide, please. 
follow us to learn more. We're always um, interested in hearing from you. Um, so please go to our Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, Instagram, or um, TikTok to connect with us. Um, and uh, please send me an email if you have any additional questions or would like to get involved at education at melanoma.org. I look forward to today's, to today's program and thank you for the partnership. Thank you both so much for sharing a little bit more about each of your organizations and all the amazing work that you do. As a reminder, resources for both, from both organizations will be included in our resource handout that will be shared with you all post webinar in the next few days. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our fantastic panel of experts, each representing the different members of the care team that help support and manage brain metastases in melanoma. We have Dr. Isabella Glitza Oliva, who is an associate professor within the Department of Melanoma Medical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. She also serves as the director of the Melanoma Leptomeningeal Disease Research Program. Also joining us is Dr. Jonathan Yang, who is an associate professor in the New York University School of Medicine's Department of Radiation Oncology. He serves as the Director of Clinical Research for the Brain and Spine Tumor Center of the NYU Perlmutter Cancer Center and is also the Associate Vice Chair for Clinical Research for the Department of Radiation Oncology. Dr. Sharice Ferguson is an Associate Professor within MD Anderson Cancer Center's Department of Neurosurgery and is also the Center Medical Director of MD Anderson's uh, West Houston campus. Dr. Ferguson's area of expertise includes surgery for primary and metastatic brain tumors and gamma knife radiosurgery. And last but not least, joining us today is Dr. Garin Dixit, who is a neuro-oncologist at Northwestern Medicine's Lou and G. Malnati Brain Tumor Institute, where he works with both primary and secondary brain tumor patients. His clinical interests include primary brain and spinal cord tumors, and neurologic complications from cancer and its associated treatment. Thank you all so much for joining us. I will now turn it over to Dr. Glitza to begin the presentation. Thank you, Embreen. And I think I can say that on behalf of my co-presenters co uh, and myself, it is such a delight to be here with all of you patients, family members, and again, would like to thank very briefly one more time the AMED Melanoma Foundation as well as the Melanoma Research Foundation, and obviously the American Brain Tumor Association for putting this program on today. And again, I hope that we are able in the next hour, hour and a half to really provide a little bit more of background and education and maybe showing you how a brain specific tumor board should function or could function um, either where you receive care or in other places around the US. So with this, let's kick it off and we'll try to be on time and make it hopefully exciting. So I was tasked to really, um, as a medical oncologist who specializes not only in melanoma, but also in um, metastatic melanoma, specifically again, to the brain and the left meninges to really just briefly summarize how do these cancer cells, and really, to be honest, this does not only apply to melanoma, but to any other cancer as well, get into the brain and spine. So with the next slide, there's a little graph, and it's very simple. Um, actually, the next slide is not this one, but really, why do we care? Why are we even here today? So melanoma brain metastases, even though, as you know, melanoma represents one of the most aggressive forms of skin cancer, skin cancer, right? There's squamous cell, basal cell carcinoma. But what a lot of people don't know unless they're faced with this horrible complication of melanoma is that melanoma of all the solid tumors, think about lung cancer, breast cancer, colon cancer, kidney cancer, um, prostate cancer has really the highest risk of making it into the brain. And when we put this into numbers, again, about 10 to 20% develop this at initial stage four diagnosis. And from autopsy studies, we do know that up to 50% of patients historically developed metastatic disease to the CNS over the course of their disease. And unfortunately, what we've also seen in the past, and things are changing, luckily, um, that when we had chemotherapy only or biochemotherapy only, that the brain represented an area that progressed first or as the initial site of what we call treatment failure, while the rest of the body was without disease. 
And putting this, unfortunately, into graphs or numbers, the median overall survival, and again, that means we had some patients that unfortunately passed much faster, with some patients that survived much longer, but the median historic overall survival was just four months. And we can speculate why this was, um, but part of it was that we really didn't have any drugs that were penetrating into the CNS and achieve intracranial responses. And sometimes these responses were, again, either between zero or maybe 10%. And unfortunately, as some of you on the call today might know, leptomeningeal disease, again, not just in melanoma, but in all other cancers, just represents a further complication of what we would call brain metastases that is unfortunately associated with even poorer outcomes. So with the next slide, and Breen, let's talk a little bit more about how these cells get into the brain. So it is a multi-step process. And again, the reason why we're actually even um, focusing on this, because we're not there yet to actually prevent these additional steps. And again, if there are questions, um, I think this is a huge part of research that we need to focus on and, and really just preventing brain metastases. But as you can see, there's obviously the primary tumor in melanoma, again, most commonly on the skin. And these cells literally can invade either blood vessels or they can invade lymph vessels. And if it invades the lymph vessels, it can be captured, for example, in also lymph nodes. And that is one of the reasons why we also perform a sentinel lymph node biopsy so we can actually see did cells migrate through the lymph node. But obviously the blood, with the blood, those cancer cells can go anywhere. They can go into the lung and form lung metastases. They can get into the liver, colon, liver metastases, but they also then can get into the blood vessels of your brain and then really kind of crawling through this, this what we call a um, uh, blood vessel wall, and then unfortunately form tumors there. So one maybe important thing for you all to know, we don't typically call metastases that made it into the brain brain tumors. We typically try to refer to them as brain metastases because a primary brain tumor is something different like a glioblastoma. And of course, then these cells can grow and again, potentially cause issues. So with the next slide, let's also talk a little bit about the leptomeninges. So the leptomeninges, to be just very simple, is really kind of the lining of your brain and your spinal cord. So the way that I describe it to my patients, you have a walnut, you took the shell of which is your skull, and then you have this thin brown layer that covers the whole nut. In this case, the meninges are covering your brain and it covers your whole spinal cord. And so it's kind of a very different space than when you think of the meat of your brain or kind of the, all the area under the brown skin of your walnut. And cancer cells actually get there slightly different. So for example, there's something called a choroid plexus. It's kind of one of those little things in your brain that creates the spinal fluid. And those cancer cells can kind of get through this. It's a filtering system and they can sneak through and get into the spinal fluid. And then they kind of float around freely because all of this is connected. They also obviously can penetrate again through regular blood vessels, but also they can crawl kind of along some of your nerves in your face or your spinal roots and make it again into the CSS and the spinal fluid. And again, there are other areas when they can literally kind of get from the initial tumor that we found in your brain, the metastases, and get into the um, spinal fluid. Next slide, please. And so what are some risk factors? And again, um, I don't want you to read this and say, oh my goodness, um, you know, I have a BRFV 600 mutation. I have, I'm going to get brain mass for sure. That is not the case. But we have really identified some risk factors um, that at least we kind of um, guide and look how often should we, for example, do regular brain MRIs in order to screen those patients. And for example, patients with stage four melanoma do get fairly regular MRI brains, and every center has a slightly different schedule. But we also do this if you had a skin melanoma, right? If you have a mucosal or uveal melanoma, the likelihood of developing brain metastases is just lower. Obviously, your stage matters. If you are stage four, you have a much higher risk. And again, like I said, it's somewhere between 40 to 50% identified at autopsies. But also when you think about stage three categories, obviously somebody with a stage 3D has a higher risk of developing brain mass because the disease is more advanced than, for example, a stage 3A. As I mentioned, BRF mutations seem to have a higher associated risk. And then potentially, I put some question marks next to it, your male gender um, having an alteration of your primary and location of the primary might be some additional risk factors, again, but haven't been validated in larger um, studies. Next slide, please. 
And symptoms, I know that um, Dr. Dixit will talk a little bit more about it. But again, the reason why I would like to just show this is just be aware. Um, doesn't mean that any headache or any new weakness um, is necessarily a brain metastasis. But I think it would require that you inform your team and say, gosh, I have this headache and I always had headaches, but this just feels different or it ain't going away. Or you know what, somehow I just have new weakness. Obviously, you need to be worked for it. So um, again, Dr. Dixit will talk a little bit more about it, but we just wanted to put out, um, put these signs out there to raise awareness. But we also know that a lot of patients are being diagnosed with brain metastases without any signs of, um, of symptoms associated with it. So again, that's why you reuse the screening MRIs to pick up um, brain metastases early. Next slide, please. So. Now I'm just gonna switch already to a little bit of treatment. And again, in my mind, the multidisciplinary approach, which again, my three colleagues are today here um, on the call with me, is really the key. And the reason why, is I'm the drug doctor, right? I'm a medical oncologist, I give systemic therapy. Um, I sometimes also do intrathecal injections for the leptomeningeal disease, but I do, every time I see a patient, ask myself, do I need radiation therapy? Do I need surgery? Who can help me with the symptom management? And again, all the colleagues that are again joining me today are important pieces of this puzzle. And I typically don't make this decision just by myself. We as a team talk about all these different options and discuss what is the right sequence. And again, how can we provide the best multidisciplinary care for our patients? Again, with the best outcomes in mind. Next slide. So now I'm gonna dive a little bit into systemic therapies and I promise I'll make this short and sweet. Next slide, please. So again, historically, and if you, I think if you click one more time and bring, we might get a red little bar. Perfect. So um, as I told you earlier, so unfortunately the median overall survival for patients with brain metastases from melanoma was really, really poor. And why was that? Well, we really just had chemotherapy, right? Until 2011 when ipilimumab was FDA approved, we had only chemotherapy or maybe IL-2. And so what you can see in the median overall survival on the very right, it ranged between you know, 160 days, 2.2 months, two months, just really horrible short life expectancy. And the response rate also varied somewhere between 0%. And I have to be honest with you, the 28% that you see at the very top is very not convincing and was not reproducible. So really, really does not work well. I think this is the message that I would like for you to take away with. But on the next slide, we've had now a little bit excitement. So let's talk about BRF MEK inhibitors first. These are so-called targeted therapies. They are only to be given to patients with a BRF V600 mutation. And again, this is present in about 40 to 50% of patients that have skin melanoma that is not kind of on the acral part, not mucosal, um, not uveal. Um, and we actually have now three FDA approved combinations using different BRF and MEK inhibitors. And the cool thing about these drugs is, and I try to explain quickly how we look at these graphs. So you can see what we call a waterfall plot on the left. So you have the line zero, and then you have all these bar below. That means there was shrinkage. Not all of them actually ended in a complete response, meaning the cancer disappeared completely. But it, you see the majority of patients actually had benefit. Now that's exciting, right? So it's a high rate of response and an even higher rate of disease control, but the problem is it just didn't last as long. And so while it was super exciting and it is an important tool, it lasts only for about six months in the brain. Again, this is a huge span and some patients, they do um, much, much better and much, much longer. But clearly this was an area that needed improved, prolonged responses. And with this, we'll head to the next slide and briefly talk about immunotherapy in um, melanoma brain metastases. And again, I promise you, I'll try to get you see these slides. So two of the most important questions are when we think about immunotherapy, did the patient have prior immunotherapy before? And does the patient currently need corticosteroids or sometimes we just call it steroids or dexamethasone most typically? Um, is the patient requiring this for all the symptoms? Now, let's talk about this was a treatment naive patient presenting with newly diagnosed brain metastases. And if you look at your left little curve, which says overall survival, and you look at the top yellow line, this is the combination of using ipilimumab and nivolumab. And at five years, 51% of patients were still alive. And I get still teary eyes when I see these numbers for our patients, because this is such a stark contrast compared to our 
four months overall survival that I talked about initially. So we really learned that the combination immunotherapy with ipilimumab and nivolumab is superior to just using nivolumab or prembolizumab and also superior to ipilimumab. Now, how about steroids? So steroids, the next curve on the right is a little bit harder to see, but when patients requiring steroids, it's a little bit tricky because you can see that they progress super rapidly. Progression means the curve goes down. And you can see that this happens literally within the first one or two months already of them being on the immunotherapy with ipilimumab and ivolumab. So the key message is if we can avoid steroids, we like it because it seems to impact a little bit how patients do. But you can see that there are no durable responses, long-term survival, again, over 50% at five years. And I think this might be the last slide that I have for this section, but let's take a quick look at the next one. Perfect. And with this, it's just my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Yang. And again, we're happy to answer any further questions about therapy later on. Thank you. Um, for, for today, I, I want to go over very broadly in terms of um, what, well, number one, what do radiation oncologists uh, think about when we make a decision for local therapy? for brain metastasis and leptomeningeal disease, um, and, and um, as well as some of the, uh, the, the treatment option that you may have heard about uh, from your, your uh, care team. Next slide. And um, this is a very uh, generalized, um, a very simplified way of, of how uh, some, some of the things that radiation oncologists think about uh, when we first meet with you and and uh, and think about uh, the indication for for radiation in, in your specific care, uh, I will say that there's a lot of nuances in our decision making process that's not going to be captured here. And this part of the talk really is meant to uh, introduce uh, and and uh, some of the concept that that you may have heard about uh, in in your own journey. Um, so, so the first thing that we often think about is what is the indication for radiation? Is there data that actually show that radiation can, can help uh, our patients in a specific condition? Uh, and, and following that is what, what is the goal of radiation? Are we trying to increase the probability of cure or are we, are we here to palliate symptoms and to improve uh, quality of life in our patients? And following that um, is what is the radiation treatment target? We have to decide on what do we target and what do we treat in order to help us to achieve the goal that that uh, I have made with my decision uh, with my with my patient and in in, uh, in a shared decision making process, for example. Um, and lastly, what type of radiation? And, and there, uh, there are multiple different kinds of radiation treatment. Um, uh, many of you may have heard about photon and uh, electron, and and um, and proton treatment. And there, there are different types of radiation with different property um, uh, that radiation oncologists use as tools to to achieve the goal that uh, we aim, uh, we set out to uh, to achieve. Next slide. And for brain metastasis, um, I, I'll just walk through this slide uh, uh, quickly uh, uh, using the principles that, that I just mentioned. Um, the first thing that we think about um, in, in terms of uh, the indication for radiation is a, it's really is a shared decision-making process uh, with our patients. Uh, we consider many, many things in this process, including uh, how the patients are doing, what specific kind of disease, uh, what is going on um, um, in the body, um, and then uh, to think about what is the goal of radiation here, and, and for brain metastasis, the goal, the, the, the sure goal, is, it's quite often uh, 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 controlling uh, the brain metastasis um, uh, that the parents, uh, that our patients are experiencing. Following that, um, the next step is to think about what will, uh, uh, what is the, the the treatment target for radiation? Are, are we covering limited brain metastasis, or are we treating? Uh, uh, many, many brain metastases in one setting, and that often lead to a decision of uh, um, what we um, uh, of stereotactic radio surgery or whole brain radiation therapy. Uh, although they're not mutually exclusive, uh, a patient can have both. Um, and and I'll go over um, more specific of each on um, next slide. So in terms of stereotactic radio surgery. So what these are are very um, uh, focal radiation beings uh, to specific areas of, of tumor. And, and quite often we do this uh, for tumor that were resected or removed as well. 
Um, the goal of this treatment is to concentrate the radiation uh, on the tumor or the, uh, or the tumor cavity, and therefore achieving control um, of, the, uh, of the tumor that's being treated. Uh, in, the, from, in this approach, we don't treat the entire brain. We treat specifically uh, uh, different areas in the brain. And on the other side, it's whole brain radiation therapy, where we, we treat the entire brain. Um, and, and the goal here is to cover the, uh, all the diseases that we can see on, on the MRI scan, as well as diseases that we don't see on the MRI scan. Uh, more recently, uh, we have, um, as a field, have adopted hippocampal sparing whole brain radiation. You may have heard this term, where we avoid treating a specific part of the brain uh, that's uh, we felt to be responsible to to um, to some of the cognitive changes of, after whole brain radiation, and studies have shown that by avoiding this area, we do reduce the risk of that. Um, another medication that you may have heard of is memantine, which is quite often given with whole brain radiation therapy, which I will go over on the next slide. So memantine, it's it's a NMDA antagonist, and it's to it has been used to slow progression of Alzheimer's disease. And there have been several studies that have shown that uh, if you uh, memantine does reduce the risk of neurocognitive uh, decline after whole brain radiation therapy. Uh, for patients who are on memantine, uh, this is a six month commitment. Um, you start at the when you start the whole brain radiation, and you continue. Uh, for six months um, uh, uh, duration of, of the treatment. And, and uh, luckily, in general, this, this is a very well-tolerated uh, um, uh, drug with, very, uh, with various uh, low-risk side effects, such as fatigue, uh, feeling tired, feeling dizzy, and some patients uh, can have abdominal discomfort. And there are multiple ongoing um, and trials in terms of um, uh, using stereotactic radio surgery for multiple brain metastases, uh, as opposed to hippocampal sparing, whole brain radiation, memantine. Next slide. For leptomeningeal metastasis, again, we go through the same process. Uh, we first think about whether radiation has a role uh, in, in your specific care. Um, and then, oops. sorry, and then we, we uh, determine what is the goal of our treatment. If the goal is for uh, palliation of specific parts uh, of specific symptoms related to the uh, leptomeninges, uh, we often employ a treatment called involved field radiotherapy. And what that is typically is open radiation or focal spine radiation. If the goal is to uh, control the disease as well as palliate the symptoms and prevent symptoms from um, uh, happening throughout the entire CNS, uh, the cranial uh, spinal axis, uh, we do think about using cranial spinal radiation where we, we would treat all the uh, diseases. Uh, I often tell my patients are hiding in the fluid and in leptomeninges and, and to, to get the disease under better control. And after that, the decision making becomes what kind of radiation if we proceed with cranial spinal, do we use proton and do we use photon? And these are, are some of the um, uh, processes that your radiation oncologist would discuss with you. Next slide. And this is just a graphic example of what I just described. On the left is the involved field radiotherapy. Again, we're treating specific parts of the uh, central nervous system. This is a partial treatment of the central nervous system. And uh, on the right here is the craniospinal radiation, where we're using uh, radiation to treat the entire uh, central nervous system to, to treat all the diseases that, that we're unable to see uh, uh, related to leptomeningeal metastasis. Uh, and the difference between proton versus photon um, is that uh, photon radiation is like a light particle, so, so it can penetrate uh, your body through a very uh, long distance, while proton radiation is a heavy particle where it stops after a certain distance. So, so quite often when we think about craniospinal radiation, we think about protons, so, so we don't treat um, any, anywhere um, in front of the spine uh, in your body. Uh, we don't expose any of the organ to radiation with proton. Next slide. The, well, in terms of uh, the decision making for leptomeningeal metastasis, it is it is a complicated um, decision process. Um, uh, not only we have to decide what is our goal here, we also have to take account into how are our patients doing, and whether they can tolerate uh, the type of treatments that that we're discussing. 
But ultimately, I, I think what is worth emphasizing here is that this really truly is a team sport. Uh, radiation therapy, uh, it's a local treatment. Uh, so even if we use proton to treat the entire craniospinal axis, uh, we're not touching the systemic disease. And, and we also know that systemic disease control is extremely important. That um, I often tell patients that, you know, let, uh, even if I clean out or, or reduce as many tumor cells in the, in, uh, in, the, in the central nervous system, if we don't get the systemic disease under control, they, they, they can't find their way back. So, so this is truly a collaboration um, between uh, uh, medical oncologists, uh, like Dr. Glitza and, 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 and radiation oncologists. Uh, in addition, uh, we also require um, neuro-oncologists to help us to, to have detailed and longitudinal neurologic uh, evaluation of your symptoms and, and managing our symptoms. And, and, um, and lastly, um, in some patients with left meningeal metastasis, uh, diversion of CSF through shunt, uh, a surgical procedure can, can quite often uh, provide uh, symptom relief and, and, and symptom management. So again, this is, this is not a uh, one person job. This is it's just, it requires a, a team, a village, uh, to really to 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 help our patients uh, with CNS disease. Next slide. And I, I want to end this portion of the talk with with uh, with uh, some exciting development in terms of radiation therapy in combination with immunotherapy. Um, I think uh, many of you may have uh, heard from your providers or uh, from your, um, your 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 support group that um, uh, there are a lot of investigation ongoing about radiation therapy with immunotherapy. And, and you have just heard that immunotherapy has really changed the landscape in terms of how we approach melanoma. And the thought here is that there is a synergistic interaction. Uh, multiple studies are ongoing, and hopefully that we will be able to have more information uh, soon about this approach. Um, and, and hope that we can bring uh, a, a new treatment combination uh, for our patients. And I believe that's my last slide. Thank you. All right. Well, I guess I'm up. I'm Sharice Ferguson from MD Anderson, and I'm going to talk about my favorite topic, the role of surgery in brain metastasis. Next slide. So, you know, just a, a quick heads up, this is a talk about surgery. So there might be some, well, not might be, there will be some pictures with uh, some brain, some skull, um, some live surgery pictures. So hopefully it's not too intense for you, um, but I'll warn you when those, time, those slides are coming up. Next slide. So the first thing to talk about is who do we even offer surgery to? Because as you know, every patient that has a brain metastatic disease doesn't always get offered a surgery. It's reserved for a select population of patients. And those patients typically have the characteristics that I've listed in the blue box for you there. So typically we offer surgery to patients with uh, large brain tumors, and that sometimes are symptomatic with neurological symptoms like headaches, nausea, or vomiting, typical of the picture we see at the bottom to the left there. Uh, second consideration is the number of tumors somebody has. So, um, you know, uh, we ideally have patients with a low number of brain tumors because, you know, realistically, we can't take out 10 brain tumors in one sitting safely. So typically, we can take out one to three lesions in a single operation. Uh, our next consideration is the tumor location, um, accessible locations or that are, you know, accessible locations being close to the surface of the brain or not in cortex that is functional is usually favorable because they have the lower surgical risk. And lastly, um, we do offer uh, patient surgery to tumors that have failed previous treatments. Uh, with modern treatments like immunotherapy that was mentioned before and stereotactic radio surgery and gamma knife, uh, open surgery is not often definitely not always the first line of treatment because we want to offer people less invasive options when we get to an open surgery if feasible. However, if these options were to fail, um, then invasive treatment with surgery is sometimes wanted. And overall, our main surgical goals are to the right there are to relieve neurological symptoms and maximize tumor control, reducing risk of recurrence. Next slide. So focusing on our surgical goals, so the first main goal is to relieve neurological symptoms, but a question may be why do brain metastases cause symptoms and how does surgery help? So the first thing to consider is that the skull or the cranium is a fixed container. So unlike the abdomen or the belly, which we know can get bigger and smaller and expand, the skull is rigid. It has uh, no flexibility, so it cannot expand. It only has room for three, your brain, 
cerebral spinous fluid or CSF, which is the fluid that the brain is sitting in, and blood, which the normal blood, that's the normal blood flow to the brain. Next slide. Now, when you have a brain metastasis, the balance between the brain, the blood, and the CSF gets disrupted. And since the skull cannot expand and make extra space, there's no room for the brain tumor. The result of this is increased pressure in the brain, referred to as increased intracranial pressure, which is a term you may have heard before. And this increased pressure causes the symptoms that we associate with brain metastasis, which both of my colleagues have mentioned, headache, nausea and vomiting, altered mental status, weakness, and all the things that I've listed here. And surgery is especially effective in this situation because tumor removal is the fastest and most effective way to relieve um, elevated intracranial pressure, restore the balance of the structures of the skull, um, and immediately take the pressure off the brain, relieving symptoms. Next slide. Our second goal is to maximize tumor control, and our overarching surgical goal is typically always complete resection, or what they may refer to, you might hear referred to as a gross total resection, or to make the tumor as small as safely possible. And of course, the idea is the small we make the tumor, the more effective post-operative adjuvant therapies such as immunotherapy or post-operative radiation can be, ultimately with the goal of reducing uh, the risk of the tumor coming back in the future. Next slide. So uh, as I'm sure you can appreciate, uh, brain surgery is a big deal. And for those of those people who need it, it ends up being often the biggest surgery people have in their life. And this is because the brain has a lot of critical functions, which I've uh, put up here in the schematic here on the top left. Um, so surgery for brain metastatic lesions have uh, a bunch of unique considerations. So, you know, unlike breast cancer, where you can remove the whole breast, or other organs like the prostate, the uterus, and the colon, where you can remove large segments of the organ or sometimes even the whole organ, that is not an option with the brain. You cannot always freely resect large segments of the brain because the brain is not free, as you can see from the diagram that I showed you there. So the first step in every brain surgery before we do any cutting is a careful calculation of how much tumor would come out without with minimal to no disruption of functional brain. And when I talk about functional brain, um, there's lots of important functions in the brain, but the ones we're most concerned about are motor and speech function because they mostly impact quality of life. So our ultimate goal is to take out as much tumor as possible, but maintain good functional status and good quality of life after surgery. Next slide. So since once you decide to do surgery, the next question is how we do it. And just warning, this is the slide where the surgery pictures start. Uh, so a typical operation we would offer is called a craniotomy. And this is where we make an incision in the scalp. We take a small drill to remove a window of bone, and then we expose the brain so we could get access to the tuber. Click ahead, please. This is a picture of what the brain looks like intraoperatively. So you can see the rounding brain around it. That reddish circular structure in the middle is the tumor. And then you can see the skull right there. Next, next click, please. So this is what we do in surgery. That schematic, that cartoon at the top there shows you the brain metastasis and the surrounding normal brain. And the next picture shows you how the brain, how the tumor looks when it's coming out and the fully removed tumor off to the side as a pathological specimen. And the bottom picture shows you what the brain looks like after the uh, tumor is removed, a nice clean cavity and the brain is nice and relaxed. Next slide. So, you know, what if it's complicated? Well, you know, technically it's always kind of complicated because there's a lots of things to consider. So in addition to motor and language function, your surgeon may talk to you about important arteries or veins that are close to or entangled around the tumor, which may also impact your surgical risk. There's an important part of the discussion, always keeping in mind that the ultimate goal is maximal tumor removal with, remaining, with uh, maintenance of good function. And the surrounding arteries and veins are almost as important as the brain cortex itself in terms of maintaining function. Next slide. So with all these things considered, what tools do we have uh, you know, to keep you safe within an operation? And it turns out, in fact, we have many tools to, to keep you safe. Um, so before the operation, we have tools to enhance your MRI to make 3D reconstructions of the tumor to get us better spatial representation, which allows us to have better planning in advance of surgery. For example, this, this patient here had a tumor here. We made a 3D reconstruction in order to see how the tumor sits exactly spatially 
in relation to the motor fibers that are there in the bottom in the blue. And this allows us not only to plan a good operation, but also it allows us to have a thoughtful conversation with patients ahead of time to give a good estimation of their of their intraoperative and postoperative risk and what to expect in terms of their recovery. Next slide. In the OR, I mentioned before, there are two areas that we really want to protect, which is the motor area and the speech area. And we do these using specific mapping, brain mapping techniques. So to protect the motor area, first we have to, you know, locate the motor area because the brain doesn't come with any labels on it, right? To let us know where it is. We have to find these areas anatomically and live and in the operation. So what we can do is before surgery, like I mentioned before, we make 3D reconstruction to show how the motor fibers interact with the tumor. Of course, this picture on the right, you can see the motor fibers are on both sides of the tumor. So with this kind of plan, we can plan how we're going to do our craniotomy, where it's going to land, and how we can attack the tumor, what angle to approach it in order to spare those motor fibers. Next slide. In the operating room, we can actually put electrode grids directly onto the brain that monitor signals coming from the brain that have motor function. And then we can avoid the areas that have live motor function. And we also can get direct feedback during the operation that these motor fibers stay intact while we're resecting the tumor to make sure we're avoiding clinical mo critical motor areas. But, so for speech function, the only way to monitor speech is for patients to be awake during the operation. This way, patients can talk to us during the operation so we can hear them through the whole operation to make sure their speech function is maintained. During the operation, we also sometimes show picture cards for naming. We show sentences for reading so we can just, you know, also make sure that specific language um, task and, and cognitive processes are still intact while we're doing the operation. Now, I know awake surgery um, might seem very scary, but we try to keep patients awake for the minimal amount of time we need them to do this critical mapping part. And our thoughtful anesthesia team has many techniques to keep people really comfortable during this operation. Next slide, please. And then lastly, to measure our success in the operating room, we have special imaging during the operation to see how the tumor removal is going and to determine when maximal safe resection has been achieved. So we can use this interoperatively just as using an interoperative ultrasound. This picture here shows the tumor on the left and how we can use the ultrasound in the operating room to try and find the tumor. Click ahead, please. This is how the tumor looks on an ultrasound. You can see that ball right there showing the tumor. And then the picture right next to it showing the cavity after removal and showing that complete resection has been achieved. Um, lastly, some uh, institutions have an intraoperative MRI, which allows us to actually do an MRI during the operation. So during the operation, we can stop doing MRI, see how our resection is going, and make sure we've gotten out the maximum amount of tumor before closing and waking up the patient. Next slide. Now, these are just some commonly asked questions that patients ask when they come for their surgical console. So I thought it might be helpful to go through some of these. The first one I'm always asked is how long does uh, surgery take? I, my always answer is it takes the exact right amount of time. But the general answer is it depends on the size of location and complexity of the tumor. Tumors in functional areas, like I mentioned before, speech and motor might take a little longer. But on average, it takes about three to four hours. Will you shave my hair? Uh, yes, we usually do have to shave the hair. We don't shave your whole head. We uh, typically shave only over the area that you're going to have to have the operation. Next, uh, how long will I be in the hospital? Um, so it kind of depends. It depends on the complexity of the surgery, the length of the surgery, and most importantly, your pre-surgical fitness. Someone who plays tennis every day, walking to work every day, very, very fit, might have a shorter recovery time than someone who's a little frailer, and so that's a big determinant of how long you're in the hospital. But typically an uncomplicated operation will take about three to four days with you in the hospital. Uh, will I need radiation after all the tumor is removed? The answer is yes. So even if all the tumors removed, we still worry about microscopic cellular disease that may not be apparent on the MRI. So because of that, we want to uh, reduce the risk of recurrence from those microscopic cells. And so we typically follow surgery with radiation, this is uh, still the standard of care. And lastly, how long before I can restart my systemic therapy? Often patients are on immunotherapy or chemotherapy, and generally you can resume therapy after the healing is done. Typically patients have stitches or staples for, in for 10 to 14 days. When those are removed and there's no healing complications, typically it's okay 
to go ahead and restart your therapy. And we always discuss this with the medical oncology team. I think that might be my last slide. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, it's an honor uh, and a privilege to speak with all of you. Uh, my name is Karen Dixon. I'm a neuro-oncologist at Northwestern, uh, neurologist and neuro-oncologist, and uh, here to talk to you a little bit about neurologic complications. Uh, the brain is very expensive real estate, as Dr. Ferguson so uh, nicely stated and demonstrated. Um, so we'll go through a few things that, as a neuro-oncologist, how can I help uh, our colleagues in medical oncology, radiation oncology, and neurosurgery, uh, and ultimately patients and family members. Um, the brain is a highly complex organ. Um, and just like they say about real estate, it's all about location. Um, what's very curious and very interesting about the nervous system is that we have symptoms, um, as Dr. Ferguson uh, showed and mentioned, that are what we call focal, that are defined based on um, the exact location um, uh, where, the, where the abnormality is, where the tumor is. Um, weakness, sensor changes, language, uh, visual changes, uh, balance issues, they all arise from typically from certain parts of the brain. The brain is also a very highly collect, uh, uh, connected network. Uh, as we're learning more about, more and more about how the brain functions, you know, it's not purely just the fact that something's in one area, is how does it connect with other, other parts of the nervous system. You know, it's very common for, uh, for uh, people who have had brain metastases, who have had surgery, radiation, uh, medical therapy, uh, overall doing well, but it's kind of a sense of some symptomatology. And it's always hard to pin down exactly. You know, we can't look at a brain scan and say, X lesion is causing the symptom. It's more of a global dysfunction, a, a global uh, disruption of uh, brain networks that is likely uh, contributing. And this is where other symptoms can potentially uh, arise from, specifically cognitive changes, personality changes, fatigue, balance issues, can be just kind of from just generalized dysfunction. And then uh, when there's elevated pressure, well, that's kind of when there's more of a concern when there's uh, symptoms like headache, nausea, vomiting, that tends to be more of a global issue from pressure building up in the nervous system. So I like this diagram here because it kind of shows, um, and it's way more complex than this actually, um, how different parts of the brain, uh, parts of the brain that we didn't think were involved in certain things, um, are really uh, highly uh, connected to one another. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this here is um, uh, it's a, a small table of uh, the most common things that uh, we see people for or people who have any kind of brain metastases uh, develop. So about a, I would say about a, a six, uh, two thirds of patients with brain metastases have some sort of neurologic symptom that is either dis at least a discovery of the tumor or they or they experience as part of their uh, the, uh, disease and then we want to ultimately manage. And the bolded ones are the ones that we'll spend more time talking about. Um, headaches, I think, are important. Um, you know, up to 40% of people will, will have headaches. Um, I think it's very important, uh, as was said earlier, but Dr. Glitza, is that not every headache means there's a brain tumor. Um, so one, uh, we tell people a single headache does not mean there's a brain tumor. Uh, and vice versa, just 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 have a brain tumor um, doesn't mean that a headache means something is getting worse. Uh, it's very, very common to have headaches, and most headaches are unrelated to brain metastases. Uh, we'll talk about the specific things that we look out for as, as neurologists. When do we have to um, um, become more concerned? When does our when when does our alarm bell start ringing potentially? Uh, the term altered mental status is kind of a broad term. It's a term that uh, I'm not a big fan of because it means a lot of things. Uh, for one person, that can mean um, not knowing what year it is, which ultimately doesn't mean much. No, um, the on other spectrum, it could be inability to speak completely. Um, and so there's a broad sense of kind of what that term means. Uh, weakness can occur, you know, but a, th but a third of patients can have some sort of weakness uh, in, any, in, any, in any part of the body. And then the other thing we'll spend more time talking about is, of course, seizures. Um, you know, seizures are something that um, have a significant impact on quality of life. Uh, they can be quite limiting. Uh, you know, people who have seizures as part of their uh, disease course, uh, there's a certain level of anxiety that um, uh, naturally develops 
develops as part of it. And our goal is to uh, get people through that, make sure we treat them appropriately, keep them on uh, medications for as long as necessary, uh, not longer than needed, and also find the right combination of uh, medications. And balance issues, uh, a little less common. Uh, at least uh, people can have a little bit of unsteadiness, but we're talking about someone who has difficulty walking and falling into things. So that's not as common. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, the next set of symptoms that I think is important to, uh, I think for any clinician who sees people uh, uh, with cancer and you know, especially patients and family members to be mindful of are a variety of symptoms that can occur um, with leptomeningeal disease. Um, you know, when the spinal fluid is involved, um, you know, it is more of a disseminated process. That is one area uh, is impacted. Uh, and so this is kind of where you can see there's a, there's a whole list of potential symptoms. But, you know, I'd like you to uh, focus on some of the percentages. Many of these are not associated with uh, or have a high association with leptomeningeal disease. However, progressive headaches uh, are somewhat common. Double vision tends to happen. Uh, uh, the term lower motor neuron weakness tends to be if people have some weakness in the, of a limb. So usually if someone uh, is experiencing symptoms, especially multiple of these symptoms together, uh, like a combination of headaches, maybe some memory changes or confusion, uh, maybe some balance issues, these are things that would prompt us as clinicians, as neurologists, neuro-oncologists, and uh, you know, also your, uh, your other medical team to at least think about, hey, is this something that we need to evaluate people for? Because um, I think in my mind, what's very important is it's it's very critical to diagnosis as early as possible. Um, you know, the sooner we, if this is developing in anyone, the sooner we identify it, I think the more effective the treatments that we utilize are. The people who identify leptomeningeal disease when it's a single symptom versus when it's bulky on the imaging, I think the expectation uh, and response to treatment is uh, quite different. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about headaches specifically. Um, you know, uh, it's I was always curious when you know when I meet people for the first time, uh, and many times these these uh, uh, these metastases are found incidentally. You know, as we do screening MRIs uh, in people with melanoma, um, it's not uncommon to find these. And then you know, I meet with people and they're like, "A doc, I didn't know I had these. I didn't have a headache." That's usually the first symptom that people naturally attribute to brain metastases, but it's actually not the most common symptom. Um, only about a fourth of people might have headaches. Um, in medicine, we're often taught a specific kind of headache that uh, we're taught if this happens to someone, you've got to image someone's brain immediately. And that's kind of at the bottom of the slide, which is uh, this what we call a morning headache. It's kind of the classic description of a brain tumor headache. Um, and the idea for that is as someone's laying down for sleep, uh, the body is perpendicular, uh, is, uh, is, is parallel to the ground, perpendicular to gravity, and the pressure builds up and thus they have headaches when they lay flat. However, in reality, that's not the most common uh, kind of headache. Uh, the headaches we tend to see more often are what we call nonspecific, really kind of anything, uh, dull headaches, throbbing. Uh, they can be on both sides that we uh, tend to associate with kind of more traditional common headaches that we call tension headaches. However, when we get concerned, when someone says they have headaches to me, I ask basically a series of questions. And I think something that I think family members and caregivers can also maybe think of this uh, potential uh, set of questions if uh, you know, someone has headaches is one, is it worse with bending over, worse with Valsalva? That's kind of, that's the moment of kind of bearing down, like having a bowel movement or coughing. Um, if there's a headache specifically brought on or worsened by those, that's one thing and not in isolation, but that is one thing that uh, would, in my mind, be like, okay, well, that's maybe something I need to be a little bit more concerned about. Headaches associated with nausea and vomiting, uh, specifically when they're together, not separate, but together, is something that is also important. Uh, another kind of like tick on the checklist that, okay, well, perhaps I should be a little bit more uh, concerned about that one. We should maybe get imaging sooner, or even if imaging is not showing anything, do I have to, uh, do I have to escalate workup uh, for other things? And then, of course, the main thing is that it progressively worsens. Uh, it sounds silly, uh, simple, but that's what it is in most cases. Uh, if it's a headache from a tumor, it will progress. Uh, if it's not from a tumor, it should go away and not be much of an issue. Um, 
And so these are kind of, I think, important symptoms that uh, uh, if you describe headaches to any of your doctors is to kind of think about this and mention these specific things, you know, it's worsening with this, I'm having this, and I'm noticing that it's been worsening over the course of the past few days, weeks, that I think that would potentially prompt someone to get a scan sooner if uh, you're not scheduled for one. Um, just to kind of make sure we're not missing anything. And then of course, the last thing we want to do is find headaches, you know, when it's um, when it's already a bigger issue, when there's pressure building up, that's where people have headaches associated with nausea, vomiting and drowsiness. So those are things that we want to try to capture before that occurs. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the next thing we'll talk a little bit about will be seizures. Um, in brain metastases, is not are not super common. Um, you know, certain brain tumors, uh, uh, the uh, the uh, incidence of seizures is eighty to ninety percent. Uh, in brain metastases, uh, these are uh, less frequent. You know, up to thirty percent. Um, you know, some of this data comes from, I think, as a field, what questions we ask, you know, what, is, what does the word seizure mean? Uh, as a neurologist, the word seizure means something very specific um, to the general population. I think if I ask the word seizure, uh, there's a kind of a thought of a connotation of what that means, which is convulsing, you know, foaming at the mouth, something we see on TV. Um, but uh, I, I think it's important to think about um, where lesions are in the brain, seizures, tend to uh, cause symptoms from the location. And that's kind of why location is so important. You know, when I see people, I look at the brain scan, I think about symptoms based on the location of, uh, of their lesions. Um, melanoma specifically is important when it comes to seizures because of all the different types of metastases, it is one that tends to be uh, a little bit more common uh, in causing, uh, causing seizures. Uh, the reason for that is not really clear. Um, you know, is it as simple as they can be a little bit more risk of bleeding, thus being a little bit more irritated to the brain? Probably not as simple as that. It probably has to do more with a little bit of the how the microenvironment of the brain tissue is around metastases, uh, potentially causing more irritation and uh, recruiting and increasing the amount of certain neurotransmitters in certain areas. Um, the one thing that's very important is I think around surgery, it's very uh, common and appropriate to have people on medications, uh, what we'll call the perioperative period, um, just to kind of prevent seizure. That's not a time that we want anyone to have a seizure. However, the one thing I do think is important is brain tumor or brain metastases does not automatically equal putting someone on a seizure medication. Uh, the medications we use, that all have side effects. Um, seizure medications specifically work um, on decreasing neuronal activity, brain activity. And that's kind of, that's a simplistic uh, explanation of how they may make this, uh, make seizures less likely. Uh, no medication makes seizures 0%, but by decreasing overall neuronal activity, it makes seizures less likely. Um, the two most common drugs we use are a drug called Keppra and Vimpat. Um, they're very well tolerated. They don't interact with other medications. They can be given intravenously and they work very fast and they can be given orally, which is why I think they're kind of our two heavy, uh, uh, our biggest lifting medications. Um, and then as I mentioned earlier, you know, what does the word seizure mean? Um, you know, we want to, we want to recognize people having seizures before they come in with a generalized convulsion. Um, and the, the, the way I think about this is if someone is having stereotyped, meaning it's the same thing over and over again, you know, if someone has a brain metastasis within the language circuit, um, then they may have speech arrest, kind of difficulty getting words out for a period of time, usually a minute or two. Most seizures self-resolve within that period of time. Uh, if someone has a uh, metastasis within the um, the motor strip or the sensory motor strip, kind of in the area of the brain called, we call the Rolandic fissure, people can have a combination of kind of sensation followed by twitching of a certain limb. Um, so these are all things that if those occur, um, those are things that would prompt someone to put start on medications uh, or order scan sooners to make sure we're not missing anything. Next slide, please. And then, of course, as our treatments are improving, um, you know, as immunotherapy, I think is really kind of one of the most exciting things when it comes to melanoma management as radiation uh, and actually post-op radiation and radiation to the brain is such an uh, important treatment, um, uh, you know, for for brain metastasis, especially melanoma, is how does this impact the, the brain tissue? Um, and these are things that we don't really truly understand yet. You know, why do some people, uh, if you take one person and they have five metastases and you radiate all five of them, not all of them will cause brain swelling, not all of them will cause this inflammatory effect. 
Um, why does that happen? Uh, we don't really know. Um, but these are things that the term that we use, you may hear this term from your doctors, it's kind of a broad term. Uh, I like to use this term broadly um, because it's called treatment effect. Um, I think one of the biggest things that has changed in our field of neuro-oncology is not thinking any growth equals tumor progression. Um, it, ta it takes me a lot to call something tumor progression these days, especially after treat a, a lesion has been um, radiated in immunotherapy, um, I think there needs to be a different marker. Uh, and so what, what swelling is, uh, 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 what we call vaginic edema, edema meaning swelling, uh, it's really accumulation of liquid fluid into the brain tissue itself that happens because the blood vessels, which are just tubes everywhere, the tubes get leaky and the water seeps out of it. And then that fluid builds up and causes brain swelling. And then subsequently, people can have symptoms associated with it. What's interesting, though, is I've seen people who have tremendous brain swelling and they have zero symptoms. So this is kind of why uh, the last thing on this slide is uh, you treat the patient and not the scan. Uh, that thing is very important. We see people with tons of brain swelling, but if they're doing fine, we just continue to monitor. Uh, but things that they can associate it with, you know, oftentimes the metastasis can be quite small, but the swelling can be out of proportion to it. And that's what can cause, you know, cognitive dysfunction, transient motor symptoms, you know, th things that come and go. Um, and then if it's severe and not treated uh, in time, uh, if it's becoming symptomatic, that's where people can have more profound um, uh, permanent issues. Um, and then, you know, another term that we use is called pseudoprogression. This is a really good picture that I like to show people. Uh, this is a patient of mine who, this is imaging over the course of almost a year. Where in the top, uh, these are images of uh, Aphrodite is given. The middle uh, a row is uh, something we call perfusion, which is an imaging modality that I think is useful that we can assess blood flow to the brain. And at the bottom, the last row is where we can assess swelling in the brain. So really, over the course of almost you know uh, you know this kind of over this nine months period, you can see that there are different patterns of changes. You know uh, when there is diuptake in the top row, you know all that really means is that the blood-brain barrier is disrupted. But again, that does not mean metastases. Um, you know, it just means that there's swelling there. And then we look at the blood flow map because, um, you know, if there's blood flow going to it, then we get more concerned about um, potentially um, uh, tumor. But if there's no blood flow there, then we're, we're, we're less concerned about active uh, tumor. And the bottom scan is looking at swelling. As you can see, that it looks relatively stable um, despite this fluctuation of uh, the diuptake. And these are all the parameters that we look at, how the person looks, and to kind of make a sense of what's really going on. Next slide, please. Uh, and then I believe this is my last slide uh, where, you know, how do we manage people who have uh, brain swelling, uh, dexamethasone or steroids is our gold standard. Um, you know, one thing is classically we dose it every six hours. Um, we tend to try to try to, you know, given that uh, every six hours is quite frequently, uh, if there's modest swelling, no major brain pushing and someone's doing OK overall and they could be OK at home. We try to dose it once or twice a day. It's more convenient. Uh, we try to give it away from bedtime to minimize insomnia. It's a very common side effect. But because immunotherapy can potentially decrease the effectiveness of uh, immunotherapy, in certain situations, we use medications uh, to that are steroid sparing agents that are very effective in treating brain swelling. And drugs like bevacizumab, Avacin, and Vasi um, are some drugs that we consider. Uh, and then the thoughts is, how can we make your immunotherapy? How can we overall make the overall treatment effective? Because as uh, Dr. Yang mentioned, systemic therapy is the most important thing. We got to treat the overall disease. Um, I believe this is my last slide. So I believe that the next thing is some cases we'll discuss. Thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists for sharing mo more about the different treatment modalities. We will now transition into uh, giving you a behind the scenes peek at how a tumor board works. So I'll invite all of our panelists to come back and we will have um, Dr. Glitza to help moderate and facilitate the tumor board. So I'll go ahead and get the case ready. Perfect. And I think we wanted to jump straight into case two, just so we have time for questions and we've seen some questions coming through. So this is actually a um, patient, a 61-year-old female. As you can see, the initial melanoma diagnosis, really nothing concerning or you know unusual, had a melanoma three years prior. It was on the arm, treated with local excision, was really just a stage 1A melanoma, and I think really just advice to follow up with dermatology. But three years fast forward, 
suddenly presented to an outside emergency room, had headaches, dizziness, confusion, weakness, wake up. So clearly something had changed in how she was feeling. And then again, the MRI brain revealed at least 10 hemorrhagic, which means bleeding or at least blood content uh, containing brain metastases with a midline shift, which means when you kind of think of your brain as somewhat symmetric, um, it kind of shifted over due to the pressure. And then again, a PET scan revealed that there are multiple small lymph nodes um, that were potentially suspicious, um, but the MRI spine was negative for any cancer. So going straight forward. So not completely unusual. And I might actually call in a second um, to Dr. Ferguson and just kind of asking her to describe what she would think of as a neurosurgeon um, on this MRI. But again, um, you can maybe see on the first line what we decided to do for this patient. <laughs> so maybe Dr. Ferguson, I, I turn it to you. I gave it away. I gave it away. What we're gonna. What we're <laughs> but so, um, but maybe I'm gonna. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So I mean, in terms of describing the scan, um, as Dr. Glitzen mentioned, that it's because we don't see all the lesions, but we see the dominant lesion um, on the right uh, temporal lobe as you know, MRIs. The images are flipped. Um, it's a large lesion, probably greater than four and a half centimeters, causing some midline shift, and there looks like there's you know blood components within uh, the, the tumor. Thank you. And maybe calling briefly on Dr. Dixit, um, I guess when you look at the MRI, you're not completely surprised what the patient presented with, right? No, absolutely not. I mean, this patient has, um, you know, a lot of swelling. This is kind of within the temporal lobe, um, probably involving some of the motor pathway and some of the visual pathway. So absolutely the symptoms make perfect sense. Thank you. And so, as again, I gave it away already on my slide. We actually took this patient to surgery, um, number one, to remove this large lesion, but also to get some mutation testing. And um, she was URV 600 negative. She then underwent radiation therapy. And um, again, maybe I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Yang because we did two things. We radiated what we call the tumor bed after our surgeon went in, but then we also radiated the smaller brain metastases. Right. So, you know, as Dr. Ferguson mentioned earlier, um, the, the standard of care after surgical resection of a brain metastasis uh, continues to be uh, what we call adjuvant radiation just to the um, uh, the surgical cavity. And the reason for that is um, there there's been multiple trials that have shown that this reduced the risk of recurrence by at least half. Um, I, the way I typically think about it is that um, there may be one or two tiny little tumor cells that are left behind in the cavity. And I often tell my patient I'm the cleanup guy and, and to, to make sure that I sanitize the area. Um, the other smaller brain metastasis, I, I, I guess that we, we're not seeing on this uh, image here, um, I, I assume that they had a uh, single fractions uh, stereotactic radio surgery. And a lot of patients uh, equate this um, as gamma knife or, or cyber knife or these type, type of procedures. Um, and, and they are the machines that we use to deliver the stereotactic radio surgery. The, the treatment itself is stereotactic radio surgery. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, that's a very conformal kind of radiation to the tumors uh, themselves and to, to avoid treating the brain tissue, the healthy brain tissue, as much as possible. Thank you. And maybe, um, as you can see, just to move along, we then treated the patient with the combination of, let's stay on the slide one more second, sorry. We um, treated the patient then with a combination of ipilimumab and ivolumab, kind of the data that I showed you. Um, however, unfortunately, she developed side effects and required a prolonged steroid taper, as well as another medication called mycophenolate, just with a goal to actually controlling her hepatitis. And then fast forward, unfortunately, two months later, um, we um, showed some increased hemorrhage, but decreased size um, in some of the lesions and the edema, the swelling around this was also decreased. So maybe let's look at the next slide really quickly. And what you can see now is that this was now in a new position. So fast forward from November to April, what you now see in April was that, again, there was a treated metastasis before in the left anterior frontal lobe. And this was now kind of acting up. It was growing. It showed new blood. Um, again, it was larger. There was, again, some swelling. So kind of the darker gray around the really bright white spot is what we call edema. 
And then again, another area also had increased in size. And so some other areas though were doing completely fine. And again, remember the patient was off therapy at that point. Dr. Ferguson, off to you again. We operated yet again. <laughs> We, we operated on thing. And so, you know, like Dr. Glitz has said, left frontal lesion. Um, the things I'd be concerned about are symptoms I would think the patient would have from this, um, you know, on, on patients that are right-handed or left-handed, most of the time the speech is located on the left-hand side of the brain. So that'd be the first thing I'd want to know if the speech of the patient had any speech difficulties or deficits. Sometimes we do MRIs that where the patient talks during the MRI, so we can see exactly where the speech tracks go in relation to the tumor. So if they did have speech difficulty, that's something I want to look at um, uh, before surgery. If they're far away, then you can proceed with, without any more intervention, um, uh, just with the standard craniotomy. Thank you. And again, patient went to surgery, was on steroids, again, dexamethasone for swelling over multiple weeks. And let's go to the next few slides. And again, this is kind of the swelling shown that we were mentioning. Next slide. And so we restarted immunotherapy, but quite a little bit later, just with single agent nivolumab. And again, she unfortunately developed yet again weakness and decreased mobility in the upper extremities and was treated with prednisone again. And what you can see again, fast forward. So again, this is you know kind of a marathon that we took our patients through. Um, in October of 2021, you can see that she um, had again a midline shift. Um, now again, in the in the other side that we just took out, and had again increasing edema and mass effect, and was started on slow dexamethasone taper, with the thought of this potentially being radiation necrosis. And Dr. Yang and maybe Dr. Dixit, if I could call on both of you for just a few minutes to explain to us what radiation necrosis actually means. And again, for Dr. Dixit, maybe the symptoms that we can see again from, from this kind of complication of radiation. Right, so, so what radiation necrosis is, is, is a, um, so it's a broad turn in terms of the treatment related changes after radiation at a specific area uh, in the brain. Um, the, you know, as Dr. Dixit mentioned earlier that the, the bio of radiation necrosis is still a, a little bit of, uh, of under investigation and and um, but but the thought process is that um, there is an accumulation of inflammatory changes um, uh, in the area that was treated before uh, quite often uh, on the on the MRI report uh, it, it, it's a little bit scary in the sense that patient can often mistaken it as a uh, tumor coming back in that area. Um, um, and, and that's why um, it is really important to, to, um, to have this conversation with your provider to, to, to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, in terms of symptom, I'll, take, I'll turn it over. Yeah, uh, yeah. so in this location, often the symptoms can be consistent with you know the location and where the, the primary symptoms were. In this case, you know, maybe some weakness on the left side, you know, as is the right side of brain lesion, maybe some visual changes. You know, the one thing is the, the, the imaging appearance of this, it looks less like a mass and more like a diffuse web of some abnormal brain changes. And so, you know, oftentimes when we see brain imaging, we can sometimes get at least a gut sense of are we dealing with tumor regrowth or radiation necrosis or some sort of treatment effect is based on do, do these abnormalities look like tumor masses or is kind of more of an inflammatory process? And many times we will see swelling out of proportion, uh, more, more irritation to the brain when there's an inflammatory process going on such as this. Um, so um, those are symptoms that we think about uh, when people come in with worsening symptoms, with the scan, with the prior area that's been radiated uh, before. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Dr. Dis, next slide, please. And again, you can see the swelling, which is kind of this white flower and kind of the web that Dr. Dix had just beautifully described. Next slide, please. And so again, um, it was concerning for radiation necrosis. We used another drug um, instead of just dexamethasone called bevacizumab or brand name Avastin. And we actually continued her immunotherapy. And all this was discontinued because her brain swelling and the radiation necrosis really kind of resolved with this intervention. And again, I know her very well, and she has not experienced any cancer recurrence. And even though she really dealt with, I would say, post-treatment issues for quite a while after her initial diagnosis, this is again a patient um, that came in with a pretty scary looking brain, but has been doing well 
now in even in May 2024. So I think this was actually the last slide of the um, case. Um, perfect. And and Breen, to maybe ask you quickly, I've been already um, eyeing the chat a little bit, and there are a few questions that I might be able to very rapidly answer unless you want to guide us to how to best do this in a different way. Yeah, if you want to start by answering a few of the questions that you had in mind, please feel free to do so. And just as a reminder for our audience, if you do have more questions, uh, just type and submit them using the Q&A button and we'll get through as many as we can. So Dr. Glitz, I'll let you start us off. And then uh, once you answer a couple, I'll jump in and help filter through the other questions. Perfect. And I'm just going to jump into the ones that I can easily answer. So my apologies. So um, Ed asked if we have any mature data of the ABCX trial coming out of Australia and just for the audience. So we know now that ipilimumab and nivolumab is again a great initial immunotherapy combination for patients with brain meds. And what this trial is asking is matching patients to either just getting the ipilimumab and nivolumab or adding the stereotactic radiosurgery to it. And no, we don't have any data yet from this trial being reported, but I can tell you that I think the field has moved forward that we are not as scared anymore to do radiation and immunotherapy kind of concurrently. As a matter of fact, we actually like that. So I'm gonna grab this. The other one is um, Chris has asked, why are patients with brain meds excluded from so many trials? And I think you're preaching to the choir, every one of us here, feels the same about this, the same with leptomeningeal disease. I think we're making slow but steady progress, but I think we need patient's voice, we need advocacy to really advocate for our patients um, to really move this forward. And again, um, there is also FDA meetings that are really focusing and kind of really, I don't want to say forcing, but really recommending strongly that companies include a brain metastasis arm. As for the lump on the back of your head, so typically brain meds you can't feel. So if you have a lump on your head, what I probably would recommend is that your doctor just takes a feel and feels how it feels. And then it's not, you know, potentially doing further imaging, but that is just from hearing it a little bit less concerning for brain meds. And PVEC, we have really not tested in the brain for various reasons. I think there is, at least to my knowledge, and I'm looking to Dr. Ferguson because as a neurosurgeon, she would be the one who's injecting TVEC specifically into METS. We have injected viruses for other tumors, um, um, again, um, in, in a very um, uh, research setting. So this is not standard of care, but I'm not aware of any TVEC into the CNS. Dr. Ferguson, do you agree with me? No, I agree with you. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that. Um, it's, it's definitely not standard of care here. We, we don't have a current trial uh, evaluating that. Perfect. And then I'm going to do two more and then I'm going to hand over and bring, sorry, I'm just a little bit on a roll. And so there was one question about having um, lung metastases and um, what is potentially also a good surveillance mechanism. There are two questions, one by an anonymous person. I think the other one, um, just of having lung, it's actually the same. So just the stage four data, we don't necessarily know particularly an individual organ leading to higher brain metastases. Um, incidents, but just the fact if somebody has lung metastasis, you're by definition a stage four, and that just puts you normally at a higher risk of developing brain metastases. And currently, we don't have good, um, I think the MRI is the gold standard in surveillance, so we don't typically use Signatera or Natera or all the other circulating tumor DNAs or cell-free DNA or circulating tumor cells for surveillance or the development of brain metastases. So with this, I might actually um, hand it over to my dear colleagues. And again, I hope that this part of the session so far has been helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Glitza, for those uh, answers to a few of the questions that were coming up. Um, I'm just looking through here. Dr. Yang, we have a question here about radiation. Um, after tumor surgery and the tumor has been removed, do you ever recommend radiating the brain stem? Oh, that's a great question. Um, the, in, in general, uh, brain stem, uh, brain tumor metastases are, are um, uh, not typically candidate for surgical removal, uh, but Dr. Ferguson can, can comment uh, more on that. Um, but if uh, there, there's a uh, there was surgery and the tumor is removed. We do still use radiation to to sanitize the cavity. 
um, the, the dose of radiation is, is adjusted for critical organs in the brain, uh, critical places in the brain, and, and, and we take that into account in terms of our radiation treatment. Um, and I, I will just, uh, I'm going to also grab a couple questions here if it's okay. Um, uh, I think one of the questions was, uh, my radiation oncologist wants to put me on Boswellia for edema. Uh, and any thoughts on that? So, so this is, um, uh, you know, there's there's more and more data that's emerging that Boswellia does reduce uh, brain edema. In fact, there was actually a randomized study that looked at this specifically uh, for patient undergoing radiation. Um, and more in my practice, I'm incorporating Boswellia uh, because it's a relatively uh, easy uh, medication to take. Uh, the only uh, couple of things that I always remind patients is that, um, you know, Boswellia, the, the dose of Boswellia that, that's required to treat uh, brain edema is quite high. So, so uh, some patients may need to take a lot of pills if they are buying, you know, very low dosage pills. And, and uh, the, another big issue is that uh, this is not a, a regulated uh, medication. So, uh, so sorry, oh. I... I don't know if it's me. Uh, other panelists, are you able to hear Dr. Yang still? Yeah, the audio cut off. Okay. I, I'm okay. sorry. <laughs> oh, there you go. You're back. Okay, go great. Ahead. You can continue. Uh, it, it, I was just uh, finishing my thought on that. It, it's not FDA regulated medication, so so it is important to to verify the uh, the, the the quality of Boswellia that you do purchase. Uh, another question was, uh, is hope and radiation therapy uh, offer, still offer uh, in patient with melanoma brain metastasis? And this gets into the nuances of, of a shared decision-making process I was talking about earlier. Uh, it really depends on the goal, and, and we have to look at every patient individually as, as a whole patient. And, and um, uh, it remains a treatment for, for a lot of patients, and, and uh, it, it is a, a, a very individualized decision on that. Thank you so much, Dr. Yang. We have a question here. Uh, I'm going to direct this to you, Dr. Dixit, and other panelists, please feel free to jump in if you have something that you'd add. This question is asking about more holistic or integrative ways that we can manage some of the side effects and symptoms that you discussed during your presentation. Are you aware of any holistic or integrative approaches that you recommend to your patients who are experiencing some of the issues that you talked about? And what might you be able to recommend to our audience today? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very good question. I think when when you know we see people, um, you know, we're not just seeing a scan a person. We have to think of things holistically. So I would say anecdotally, I mean, the one question about Boswelli, I want to add on to that. Yes, I I think uh, uh, one some of the data supports its use anecdotally. I've seen it been been quite effective. So I mean, I think that's part of the you know more natural holistic approach. I and mean, it's good old fashioned frankincense. Um, you know, milk thistle specifically light therapy. We have some people who do benefit from it. Uh, many people who use curcumin as a holistic approach for as an anti-inflammatory. Um, you know, I think these are one things to have an appropriate expectation of what it's going to do. Uh, you know, have a specific symptom. Uh, you know, in Illinois where we work. Uh, um, you know, medical cannabis is um, uh, legal. Uh, and so I think many patients have elected to try that. And I see a lot of symptom uh, relief from that perspective. Again, it's just having an appropriate expectation and not thinking it's going to fix everything is very important. Um, there's a question at the bottom. Has IVIG been used to control inflammation after surgery? Um, so the inflammation after surgery is one different kind of swelling. So it would be what we call vasogenic edema, which is fluid-based. Uh, IVAG is used mainly for uh, if there's more of an immune uh, activity, like an antibody-based process. So uh, if someone can't get steroids for whatever reason, we use other things to control brain swelling. There's like mannitol or high doses of salt water. So hypertonic saline, which, which would be other ways to control swelling after surgery. Not so much IVIG. Um, uh, Jack uh, R. Evans has a question about how accurate is the MRI in catching small sort of a tumor. That's the limitation of the technique. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the maximum ma strength magnet three Tesla that we use clinically, um, things have to get to a certain size for uh, them to grow. And this is kind of thing why the treatment always has to be multidisciplinary. The systemic therapy is hopefully trying to get after what is not visible on the scan. You know, when we see people who have, you know, and the, this goes to the question about the Holborn radiation. You know, when we see 
tons of brain metastases, we have to assume more is there potentially. Um, and so we have to think that there are probably uh, microscopic disease that the MRI can't really tell. Um, that's a challenge with MRIs, which is kind of why I think symptoms for me are uh, our primary source of getting sense of what's going on and not just the MRI uh, alone. Um, Pentoxyphylin for brain aging, uh, you know, that's the general idea that you want to increase oxygenation to the brain. Uh, we sometimes use pentoxyphylin people and vitamin E uh, for people who have had radiation injuries, uh, specifically radiation uh, damage to the spinal cord. Um, you know, I can't say I've seen tremendous improvements with it, but I think it's safe enough uh, that it's certainly worth a try uh, to preserve, uh, slowly preserving brain, uh, uh, brain that's the challenge with the brain. Everyone's brain is, it's not a restorative organ. Um, that's what makes the brain challenging, right? For anyone, all of our brains every week are becoming older. Um, so I think some of the simple things is staying active, healthy diet, uh, kind of maintaining an anti-inflammatory approach, I think has been uh, somewhat helpful in uh, kind of uh, optimizing uh, brain aging as uh, much as possible. And there was one more question that I, um, from uh, iPhone by Dick Metz about uh, trouble with balance, strength, and stamina. Um, there's no drug for them. That's that's a, that's a problem. I don't think there's a drug that will make balance, strength, and stamina better. Uh, I'm a big believer when I think about treatment. Treatment to me is not just therapy, drugs, radiation, surgery, seizure meds, steroids. It's also physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy. Um, it's a global approach to really kind of help the brain uh, allow plasticity to kind of work. Um, so we see tr many people improve from those approaches. Um, so there's no drug for them, but there's a good therapist uh, that we work very closely with. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for questions. I want to thank each of our panelists for your wonderful presentations and for taking the time to answer these questions in such a thorough and um, wonderful fashion. I want to, again, thank our webinar sponsor, GT Medical Technologies, for their support of this program. And a special thank you to AIM at Melanoma and Melanoma Research Foundation for their partnership and their support in putting together this fantastic program. And finally, a special thank you to each and every one of you, our attendees, for joining us, for sharing your questions, and we hope that you had an educational and empowering experience. We encourage you to take a few minutes to complete our webinar survey by scanning the QR code on your smartphone or going to the link on the screen. Your feedback is important to us as we plan for future programs. You'll also be receiving a link to the survey in an email message along with the webinar recording and our resource handout in a few days. If you're looking for more content like this, please check out our next virtual patient and family meeting, How to Improve Quality of Life While Living with a Brain Tumor, taking place Saturday, June 8th. For more information about ABTA's programs, events, and services, visit ABTA's website at abta.org, email us at info at abta.org, or call the ABTA Care Line at 1-800-886-2282. This now concludes our webinar. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day.